Welcome to episode three of A Man Scorned. I'm your horse, your host, Trevor uh, Christensen, and, and I'm glad that I've made it this far. It's been a little bit of an adventure trying to get here, uh, but I'm glad that I've had support from the community and from the people who've sent me messages and thanks for what I've done here, and I, I appreciate everything you've done. In uh, <clears throat> To sort of show that things, if you guys can... Uh, I am the captain of Team USA White, and we are going to the WTC here in just a few months. And I have five teammates, or four teammates, excuse me, there's five of us who are going, and we all need a little bit of your support. So if you can uh, help out, we'd appreciate it. And the way you can help out is by uh, sponsoring this show on Patreon. And any funds that go to Patreon will help my teammates directly. Uh, they won't help me too much. I've already got my trip funded for, so I, I appreciate those who have helped me already. Uh, but any additional funding that I receive is going to go directly to my four teammates. Um, so if you're interested in helping out or just enjoy the show or anything like that, any additional money that I have left over will be used to help improve my cameras, my equipment, uh, maybe even add a producer to the show <laughs> instead of me having to do it all by myself. Uh, but you can... Find my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash chain attack TV. Uh, and you can, on Patreon, you can support by um, giving money per streamed game or episode of this. I also stream games of War Machine, and you can, uh, any funding you do will be like if you fund $1, uh, pledge $1, it'll be given for each episode and each game I do each month. So if I do three episodes in a month and and two games it would cost you five dollars at the end of the month and it asks you before it charges i believe and and you have the choice of backing out if you'd like or you can continue uh so any support you can provide through that i appreciate it um i'd really like to help my team uh, get to the wtc the best they can uh and and compete there so i think the wtc is going to be awesome I think uh, as far as some interesting news, um, the uh, same guys who streamed it last year are going to be streaming again this year, um, Enter the Crucible. They have a, uh, I believe it's an Indiegogo or maybe a GoFundMe campaign going on right now. I'll have to find that and see if I can't put it in the show notes. Um, so they're important to support as well. If you can give them any sort of support to try to get cameras and, and commentators to the WTC again this year, I think it's important to the growth of this hobby. So anything we can do to support those, I know that I'm going to be sending some money their way. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you uh, for what you guys have already done and for anything you plan on doing in the future to help us. So let's jump right in. Um, oh, before I do that, I'd like to apologize a little bit for the audio on episode two. One of the uh, issues with being my own producer and having to set up my own camera and mics and everything like that is that sometimes there are technical glitches that I'm not aware of until after the show is over. Uh, last week we had some audio glitches that I did not know about until the episode was completely recorded and I was uploading it to YouTube. So I, I apologize for that. I hope that I can avoid that in the future. Um, I do have a, I do a little bit of sound check, but sometimes it doesn't catch everything. So hopefully my audio has improved this week and, and hopefully we'll keep the same level of audio every episode uh, from here on out. So. Uh, anyway, let's hop right in. Uh, we're going to talk first about a beast who is, uh, was much better in Mark II, and that's the uh, Basilisk Kraya. So, I am not too happy with what's happened to the Kraya. I feel like the Kraya is seven points that is uh, poorly spent. I see some people using it in an attempt to try to put together a, a nice anti-shooting tech. I just feel like that seven points is, is better spent adding more bodies on the table or, or higher armor uh, beasts on the table that can take those shots rather than adding plus two defense to stuff within three inches. I feel like the uh, animus is just too small of an effect, too um, limited in its scope. Uh, if they have any ability that allows them to boost their range attack or to get plus two on their attack roll, it really cancels it out. Uh, it just seems like it's too much points. And the truth is, is that if without the a Drake in the list, the Cray has no offensive output, or very little, I should say. Uh, I mean, they, it can paralyze a living target, but that's just not enough. You're spending too many points to, to only get that. So, 
Um, I think if you're building a list around it, like you're building a list where you're you're planning on trying to get some, somebody paralyzed, like a caster or something, then that's interesting. I think if you're building a list around potentially, say, like a Zal 1 list with the Kray and the Basilisk Drake, uh, trying to put a Basilisk Kray on like a Gargantuan with a whole bunch of uh, bonuses and extra dice and things like that, then I think it starts getting interesting. Um, but as a support piece, the Kray, I don't think in... I don't think it's important anymore. I also don't think it really does what we need it to do. So I, I think the Cray is probably points poorly spent most of the time, uh, unless you've got something built around the Cray's other abilities. But trying to build around its animus is just too small of an effect, and you have to clump up too much uh, to make it work. I think that it could have been pretty cool if they'd made it, say, command range. That would have been really powerful, something that a caster would want to take all the time. I think that might be too powerful, but they could have made it range 5, which is the Kray's command, incidentally, but uh, that would make it only range 5 on casters and make it a far interesting, more interesting uh, animus than what it currently is. So, uh, I maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so. I'm probably going to recommend that most people avoid the Kray. Uh, additionally, it also feels like that in, in the new edition that... Support is, because it's got a lesser impact, if you spend too many points on support, even more so than before, it just doesn't help out enough, and you, you're getting to this trap of having too many support pieces, even worse than it was in Mark II. And, and Scorn has always had an issue with, with overloading on support, so um, I think that if you can avoid that, and especially in Mark III where the support is not as effective, and you really only need to take the support that you really absolutely need, and you're better off adding more points of attack somewhere along the way, um, you'll be better off. So that's kind of my opinion on the Kraya. Let me know how you feel about it. Um, we're going to move on to a unit that I loved in Mark II, and I feel like has gotten uh, slightly better in Mark III, although it, its cost went up a little bit, and that is the uh, Venator Slingers. So I think there's a lot of people who misunderstood how these worked in Mark II. I saw an awful lot of you know, forum and Facebook and Twitter posts about how people thought they were not very good. Uh, they were wrong, by the way. <laughs> They're really good, uh, especially uh, with the right caster. Now, obviously, you have to kind of put the right tools around them, but I, that got even easier in Mark III. And they added some uh, abilities to their toolbox. Now, obviously, that made some of their impact a little lesser in some locations, but I think overall, they are still a very solid unit. Um, I think that one of the things that might have changed in the transition is that before, you probably wouldn't have ever taken a min unit, and you probably only would have taken them with a very few specific casters. Uh, Hexy 2 is probably the standout caster that I can think of. Uh, in Mark III, I think there's a strong possibility that you will take a min unit of slingers in a lot of different lists, anywhere where you need a potential to hit buff and you think you can apply it with six attempts. Um, you know, obviously their, their rat is somewhat lacking, uh, but I think it can easily be overcome. In fact, I know it can. I've, I've done it quite a bit. So the slingers, uh, obviously they are now 13 points for a whole unit. Uh, they gain plus one defense, so they're de defense 13, which actually is not insignificant. That's kind of a big deal. There's going to be some that live now that didn't before. Uh, they have three attack types, which they didn't have before. Um, some of these things were sort of on them, but they added them. The Acid Bath thing, if they directly hit, they place a 3-inch AoE on the target, and models under the AoE suffer corrosion. And this is a great tool against models like um, Black Dragons, anything with Iron Zeal, a shield wall, anything that wants to stand close to each other, um, usually has high armor and a single wound. Uh, a lot of that stuff also has low defense or reasonable defense, and if you add some sort of 2-hit buff or defense debuff, and makes it even better. So some Black Spot, Rashes Feet, um, the Dakar, because they're Venators, the Dakar gives them plus one Rat, making them Rat 6. And Rat 6 is pretty respectable, especially when you have this big of an impact on the game. So uh, the Acid Bath is not something that should be ignored. It's very good at killing um, a lot of the types of infantry that we're going to see in Mark III, honestly. Um, you know, even against uh, the Mirror Match, if you see Karax, these are actually pretty good at killing Karax. Um, so, keep that in mind. Uh, their second ability, Erosion, this model gains an additional die on its uh, weapon damage rolls against uh, Construct models. Um, it lost the Undead part, uh, it kept the Construct part, 
you know, honestly, it really doesn't come up that often and I don't know that it's all that important. Uh, so I don't know that it's really that big a deal that it got scaled back. The AOE was the bigger deal. Um, additionally, the secondary bigger deal is the flare. So the models hit with this attack, lose stealth, and suffer minus two defense for one turn. And then there's a lot of people that complain that they're only wrapped five, that they have no way to see through stealth, they have to be within five inches. And truthfully, they're, they're looking sort of the wrong things. Okay, so you're getting plus two to hit, which helps the rest of the unit. Um, you are... Uh, you're applying an effect on, don't, don't worry about the stealth part of it. Just sort of just toss that out. Forget that it removes stealth. I mean, sometimes that's going to be situationally amazing and you're going to be able to use it and it's going to do some really cool stuff. But most of the time, that's not why you're taking them. You're taking them for the corrosion and for the minus two defense. And you can take a min unit and get all the value out of them that you need. However, like I said, there are multiple situations where you can put together a list or engineer a situation where the slingers are just amazing. Uh, so black spot, um, and undead, um, like uh, uh, just stuff that spammed. Uh, I don't know that there's too much of that in Mark Two, like there was, or Mark Three, like there was in Mark Two. But anytime you run into a whole lot of troops, uh, so Crix is a great example. Black Spot is going to allow them to throw kill one, probably corrode two more, throw, kill another one, corrode another, and one model is going to be able to get, uh, at the equivalent of rat seven is gonna be able to hit, you know, anywhere from three to five models, and sometimes more, depending on how tightly they're packed. And that's a pretty big impact on the game. Um, against Black Dragons, uh, Iron Fang Pikemen, reduce their defense by, defense by two, you need sixes to hit. Um, if they're standing in base to base, you're usually gonna catch two or three every time you hit. And then you don't need to worry about killing with the first one because um, you're gonna catch two or three with each one. So even though they're not gonna get the benefit of the additional attack from Black Spot, they're still gonna get some great benefit. So the, I love Hexy 2 as Slingers. I think that it works really well also with Rash's feet. Um, I think that Mortality is a great way to use the Slingers. So there's a lot of examples and ways that we can make it happen. And I think if you need to engineer something that can help you with that type of troop type, um, bring the Dakar. I mean, they're cheap enough that if you add four points, 17 point package to deal with defense and high uh, armor, single wound infantry, these guys do it well. So I think that we should consider them in our lists. Obviously they're not gonna fit in every list, but they are a tool um, that we can all use. So um, let's go on and we'll go on to the next model. I don't wanna take too much time on the slingers, obviously. Uh, the next model, I wanna talk about a minion model. Um, I haven't done this thus far on the show, but we're gonna get into it a little bit more. Uh, I'm going to talk about Orin Midwinter this week. I, I guess I talked a little bit about the Brigands last week, and we'll talk some more about the Brigands in the future because I think the Brigands are going to be a pretty core troop to scorn this edition. Uh, but I would like to talk about Orin Midwinter. He's always been an interesting model for us. Somewhat difficult to get to work at some points, but it, like a lot of times in the previous edition, I used him all the time with things like Mordekar, uh, I'm trying to think, anything where I was coming up against uh, Cricks or uh, that I wanted to use against sort of a horde spam list, sometimes against trolls, things like that. I, anything where they were their caster a little bit farther up, I loved Orin Midwinter. Now, he's changed a lot, um, but he's still really good. Uh, so, he begins the game with three power tokens, so before he had to earn power tokens to use them. Uh, he didn't need them to do his thing, but losing um, his ability to stop casting uh, just within 12 inches of him means that he needs an easier way to get power tokens. So now he doesn't get them at all, he just starts with three and he can't gain them in any other way. Uh, but he has, he has, uh, he can go stealthy or he can do a chain lightning and then he has the ability to cancel spells that are targeted models uh, within three inches of him with those tokens. Um, so uh, the Arcane Vortex, Vortex, it's the same thing that uh, uh, Haley 1 and Alexia 2 have. Uh, he has it as well. You know, truthfully, most of the time when I played him in Mark 1, I sometimes take him like Morgul 1 and stuff. There was a lot of times where really all I needed him to was to stop one or two key spells. And the opponents wouldn't even be able to cast them. In this particular case, the spell's negated, the cost is gone, they lose those resources. It's actually 
somewhat better in many ways because you get to pick when it happens and um, you get to choose whether or not you're going to spend that resource. Additionally, because he has uh, chain lightning, a boostable chain lightning, um, you know, late game, if he's still got tokens left, he can bounce off your own models and into opponent's models and boost the damage on those chain lightnings and kill important key solos and clear zones, and he just does all kinds of work. So I think that Oren has become uh, one of the go-to solos for Scorn. Uh, I think that we can find places for him when we need a little bit of anti-magic and need a little help with the troop clear if you got five extra points left over and you want to be able to uh, have a model that can contribute to late game, protect you on the approach, um, and just has uh, a lot of utility, which is what he has. I was extremely impressed. When I first read through him, I was a little disappointed with the changes they'd made, and then I played him a couple of times, and the first time he cleared uh, three models out of his own for me, I was just flat impressed. Um, I, you know, obviously I've seen some people disappointed that he can't get power tokens back, but I honestly don't think it's that big a deal. You just need to learn to be a little judicious with your uh, token spending and, and not spend them too early. You know, sometimes you'll spend one early to stop a spell or spend one to boost a chain lightning, but uh, you know, try to be careful with them, save them a little bit to last in. But the truth is, is he's still magic seven, and they're they're still they still have a good chance of killing things. So even late game, even without power tokens, I think that Orin's strong. So. Uh, love Oren. I uh, hope we see a lot more of him on the table. I think he's a great addition to the Scorn uh, Empire. So um, we are going to take him and make him one of our, our own. So uh, Void Spirit. So I see a lot of people a little uncertain about what to do with the Void Spirit. I want to talk about him. I think that his changes, initially when I first saw the changes, I was a little concerned about uh, his survivability and a few other things. All those concerns for me are gone. I've played him, I don't know, five, six times now. I put him in all kinds of lists. He is an amazing support piece, uh, hunt, uh, solo hunter sort of piece that can go out on the edge of, of your lists and do lots of work. I see other people talking about the, and he sort of fits in the same category as the Bloodrunner Master Tormentor. Now, um, I think they can fill different roles. I think they're both really good, and I don't want to tell you that you should take one or the other above each, uh, the other one. Uh, but be aware that they sort of fill some different roles. So I think the, the Blood Runner Master Tormentor is probably a little bit better at maybe leading the charge, killing you know, some models with a Thresher and then sprinting back. Whereas the um, Void Spirit's more of a kind of a flanking solo that can kind of come in, kill a model that was out on the edge and then teleport back and sort of contest flags and zones out on the edge. Um, Incorporeal is still very strong. Uh, there's a lot of people that have no way to deal with it. Um, you'll notice there's there's some casters you may not have thought of before, something like Makeda 2. You can stay death a Void Spirit. It doesn't require a living model. Um, does have to be a non-character, but I mean, a Void Spirit fits. You can stay death a Void Spirit, so if you need help maintaining a zone somewhere, um, he does a great job. So people need to have a way to deal with Incorporeal, and, and if they don't, he's just He's just really good at being able to hold uh, flags and zones, and especially flags. Uh, why I love him on flags is because if he's not in position to score, he can sit four inches back off the back of the flag, um, count the flag size a little bit. You don't want to put him all the way back because you want him, you can pre-measure this, just measure directly across the flag, nine inches, nine and a half, and, and so do you threaten anywhere that somebody's going to come in and try to contest? And if they send a solo in or a model in a unit, he's going to get boosted attack rolls, boosted damage rolls on living models. He's going to kill them most certainly, and then he's going to teleport back. And in most cases, he'll be back almost to the exact same location. So backside of, away from the flag, contesting it, keeping your opponent from scoring, holding it, or even moving up and scoring, and then being able to charge out, kill a model to clear the flag, and then teleport back to the flag. Like, you just can't... We've never really had a piece with this sort of power uh, for dealing with flags and zones before. I mean, he can step into even a 12-inch zone. He can just step, you know, two or three inches in and be basically threatening the entire zone. Uh, kill a model that tries to step in, 
teleport back. These guys are great scenario pieces, something that, that Scorn desperately needs. So find places for them. I know people are loving them with Mordekar, and obviously they're great with Mordekar, but I think that you can find locations elsewhere, especially in bricky style lists where you need a four point solo that can go off on its own and, and contest or control some things by itself. So um, I, I love the new Void Spirit. I love the teleport. I think that these guys are just rock solid for four points. Um, I think that uh, there's something that you probably need to learn when to commit and when not to commit. I think there's going to be times when just standing there and not taking any attacks and just being immune to everything except for magic attacks is going to be better for you. Um, but that's, that's the Void Spirit. So uh, let's move on to our next one that I want to talk about. Uh, which is a heavy beast that there's been a lot of talk about and discussion, and that's the Titan Sentry. So the Titan Sentry is 15 points. Uh, it's base defense 10 now, like just all the other Titans. It only has Fury 3, uh, but a base armor 19 with a shield making it armor 21. Um, it is power and strength 14 on the shield attack, power and strength 15 on the tusks, and power and strength 16 on the halberd. Uh, it has brace for impact, shield guard, it's steady. Um, and has a hard head like the Gladiator chassis does. So, there's a lot of people that think this beast is amazing. I am not in that camp. Uh, there's a lot of people who think that this beast is somewhat lackluster. I am somewhat in that camp, but not completely. Uh, here's my issue. I do think the beast has the shadow of amazing. I think the beast, with just... A little bit of a nudge and mine the nudge that I want is Fury 4 uh, I feel like this beast could be amazing or I'm also willing to accept a little bit higher power and strength on the halberd I it boggles my mind that this model has power and strength 16 on the halberd the same as the fists uh, with the the war gauntlets on a gladiator uh, I mean this is we're talking about a Titan here with the halberd not a warp wolf I, I just I don't understand why it's power strength 16. Make it power strength 17. Make it 18. Uh, make it, you know, I can think of a dozen other models that have halberds and, and pole arms and things that have higher power and strength. I just don't understand why this particular model only has a PAL 4 weapon. It just seems odd to me. So here's my issue with the, the Sentry. I feel like the Sentry is core to Scorn's identity. I All the lists I built have Sentries in them. Uh, all the lists I see have sentries in them. I think that the sentry is so important to scorn that we can't live without it. Like the, the thing that it does can't be found anywhere else except for possibly in a seven point more model, uh, Tiberian. Now Tiberian is totally worth it, and I think that he's a better upgrade for the sentry. And I think the plus two, the plus one mat, the plus two pow, the better uh, animus, the plus one. Um, the plus two strength, uh, not strength, but power on his weapon. I mean, the plus one mat, all that stuff. I, I'm sorry, I'm sort of repeating myself, but I'm trying to organize my thoughts. I think that the Tiberian is totally worth it. And I think you'll see Tiberian all over the place because he's that much better than the Sentry. He's more than seven points better. And the issue is, is I don't think you can fix the Sentry by making him cheaper because that just makes it so we can spam them. The Sentry is, is sort of poor in doing what it's supposed to do, but it's the only model we have that does it. So we're forced to take this poor model and hope that we can make it work. I, I hate that. It really bothers, bothers me. This is one of the issues I have with Scorn in the current version, is that our core models are have this great identity, but they come up just short of what everybody else's identities end up being. You know, I, I hope that this gets changed. I hope that the Sentry gets just a little bit of a change to make it stay the same way it is, but just give it a little bit more. I, you know, in all the games I play a lot of times against as quality players, I have to put the Sentry out there to take a hit, take the Alpha, get attacked. Then I turn around, I get my attacks, which are all fairly low pow, especially because his main weapon is crappy. His offhand weapons don't do a lot of damage. And then I can, at best, if they've got crappy defense, I can buy three more attacks. Now, I love his new mat, and I think that he's almost there. I think that he's a great thing, and I'm, I take him on my list because I have to. I just, I really wish he were ra or, uh, Fury 4. 
I think that Fury 4 makes it so that when that heavy comes in, fails to kill me, I can do enough damage to him to make it difficult for him and I can actually peace trade well. I don't feel like the sentry peace trades very well right now. What happens is, is they come in, do some damage, fail to kill the sentry obviously, uh, which is kind of a given. Sentry completely whiffs fails to kill anything on them, does hardly any damage whatsoever, and then they take another turn and finish off the sentry. And really, you got nothing out of your sentry. You got some a little bit of damage that you had to boost to hit and boost damage, and, and you just didn't get much out of it. And this is a heavy. I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm frustrated by the sentry. I think that it's so important to who we are and just a tad short of where it needs to be to make it work. So, um, I don't know what else do I say about the Sentry other than I love it in every way except for its Fury stat. Uh, I love what they've done. I love the Brace for Impact. I love the Shield Guard. I think that it does so much. I don't particularly care for the Animus, uh, especially because Power Strength 16 outside of being enraged just isn't enough to threaten the heavies that it needs to threaten. Um, you know, sometimes killing a, like a Weapon Master when it comes in after it's already killed you doesn't matter. You know, it really it's got to to make them think twice before coming in, and it doesn't do that. So whatever, I'm okay with the Animus. You know, I, I'm okay with what it does and, or what it doesn't do. I just, I wish that this were felt more like a heavy Titan, uh, a Titan that I could poke and make angry and make it do things, but instead it just uh, sort of lackluster. So anyway, I'm sorry to be the, the grump on the sentries. I know some people feel the way I do and other people don't. They think I'm wrong. You know, uh, I'm glad to, to discuss it. I think that it is in a right good location for the faction and I hope it makes scoring great in the end, but right now just I'm not not happy with what it does. So alright, well let's let us talk about a caster. So um, I want to talk about a caster that was a little maligned in Mark II, and that's uh, Makeda 3. So I I haven't got a lot of games in with Makeda 3 yet. I have played some games with her. Uh, I'm super excited about what she's going to do for us as far as a off pair. I don't think she's going to be a main caster for us anytime soon, but I do think that she's going to become a fairly common uh, caster pairing. So your, your secondary caster is going to be Makeda 3. In fact, I, I'm highly considering taking a uh, caster pairing to Gen Con here in just a couple of weeks that has a two caster pair with Makeda 3. So why is she such a good off pair? I think you can build her list to do whatever your primary list needs help with, whether that be troops or armor or whatever it is. And the best part about Makeda 3 is if you accidentally screw up during the list pairing process and you drop Makeda 3 into the wrong opponent, she still has tools to deal with whatever they brought. So let me give you an example. Let's say Rash S, my main list, and I build a gun line and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have this Rash S gun line. And I've seen these all over the place, tons of people with Rash S gun lines. Uh, what am I going to have an issue with? Okay, well, um, let's pretend that I have an issue with the gun line that, um, is, say, uh, here's a good example. Uh, I Rusk 2 with a bunch of black dragons. Okay, the reason you have an issue is because they have tough, uh, they don't get knocked down when they when they make their tough roll. Uh, a lot of them are just going to be playing immune to the blast damage. Maybe your attacks aren't going to be able to do enough, and even with feet, you're just not going to be able to chew through enough models. Uh, let's give another example. Let's say you're in a matchup where uh, a lot of the, you don't have blast damage in your list. Let's say you're not taking cannoneers. I don't know why you wouldn't, uh, but let's say you're not and you don't have enough blast damage to deal with, say, a bunch of uh, stealth troops or whatever they happen to be. Or maybe they're blast immune because of a spell. You know, there, there are some matchups where you take this gun list and there's lots of troops and you can't deal with it. Okay, so the secondary thing that you might run into, let's say you run into extreme armor with Rasheth. I'm sure he can blood mark and feed and take down a single target, but when feed goes away and he's still got a high armor target and he's got too many guns in the list, he's, he's also going to struggle against some of that stuff. So I think you can kind of build a balance for Rasheth list, but let's pretend in our list pairing that Rasheth is not. He's a pure gun line. So now I can take Makeda 3 as my companion to Rasheth. And Makeda 3 can be built, and it doesn't matter how you built it. You can build it with all these, uh, you know, let's say I built it with all this armor and, and beasts, uh, but Makeda 3 herself can put her spell um, 
and she can even blood boon it, uh, she could put uh, Hand of Death on herself, and with feet, she could pack man through, I don't know, 20, 30 troops, maybe more, especially if she sends off, a, you know, say, a, a good eliminator and moves a few inches and hits some more. Uh, she can kill a whole lot of troops. Now, obviously, you need to be in a situation where you're protecting her because if you're, you know, killing those troops, there's probably a few jacks in the back that you're going to need to take care of. But, you know, with with... Uh, vortex of destruction and and regardless whether she has um, troops or beasts well, how regardless how you built the list she's got damage output she can deal with with um, troops and she can deal with shooting she has built-in shield guards so you know these are all things she had before but she was sort of missing some of the package i felt like with the hand of death which just seems like it it, it the grievous wounds is a big deal for her it was always a problem when you were kind of trying to surf with her uh and ran into a tough unit um so i just i think that she answers a lot of questions now is she particularly great at any one thing no she's not uh she doesn't do anything really great maybe maybe she does killing troops great um, she has assassination threat, she kills troops fairly well, but she's not like, I think I could probably build a list that does those things better and other lists. I mean, Hexy 2 kills troops better. Uh, you know, I can, I can probably build an assassination. I mean, Rashad's probably a better assassin than she is. Uh, so no, she doesn't do anything great, but she shores up weaknesses like a boss. Like, I, you know, I don't care what you put in as your first one. You can build a Makeda 3 lease that's going to fit and make it work and do well. So I think that she's interesting. I'm excited for her. Uh, I think it's interesting to note that just a few days ago, uh, Heavy Metal Days out of Germany, uh, it's a big tournament, team tournament, they released all the lists that were that were submitted early, and I looked through a bunch of those, and I was surprised at how many Makeda 3 lists are already out there, and I think we're probably going to see more as we develop it. There was a lot of Rasheth, uh, tons of Rasheth, that was the most common caster. Uh, there was a lot of Makeda 3, there was a lot of Naresh, uh, there was some Hexy 2, um, there was some stuff like that, some various things, but there was a lot of Makeda to three and I think it's a lot because she does shore up these sort of weaknesses and I, I think if you're interested you should go uh, find those lists you can actually if you look on uh, the page 5.de guys their Twitter or even their Facebook I'm pretty sure they have a link to those lists I think they're interesting it's interesting to see what other people think of them and obviously I have to take them with a grain of salt it's a large team tournament not every team is created equal not every player uh, creates quality lists but I still think it's interesting to look through and see what everybody else's ideas are so I I spent quite a bit of time looking through those lists today and taking a look at what some of the other Scorn players are doing. Uh, obviously, Reavers and Karax are everywhere. Uh, you know, I don't know how much I had to do with that. I, I was touting their wonders in episode one and even before that on uh, various groups and, and chats. But I, I so a lot of the stuff that you expect to see is there. Um, but maybe some of the lists might surprise you, especially some of the casters. Uh, so take a look at that. Um, I think we've got some extra time now. Um, maybe I'll take just a few uh, questions from the chat, and then we'll close this up. Uh, again, I appreciate you guys' support of this uh, show, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to do it again in two weeks. So uh, let's see what, uh, what questions we have in the chat room. Um, There's, there's some concern in the chat room about the balance of War Machine versus Hordes and, and the potential possibility that they've uh, maybe gone a little too far. And um, In a recent podcast on my other show, Chain Attack, um, we talked about it and I, I mentioned how I felt like that Hordes was a step behind and uh, my co-host, Jay Larson, uh, did not feel that way. And, um, I'd be interested to know how you guys feel. If you want to send me a message on Twitter, uh, or you know wherever Facebook um, you can discuss it I think it's an interesting topic I don't know that, that there's enough data out there to actually have any sort of idea if one side is stronger or not at this point but it's certainly from a scorn perspective it certainly feels like um, you know some of the solos and uh, beast versus jacks and casters versus uh, warlocks versus war casters it does feel like that uh, you know sometimes they stopped maybe a couple steps too short on giving us a little bit of bump so but I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Um, 
Uh, okay, so a question from uh, Simple Moo. He asks, as a new to Mark III player who picked up s the Scorn box, what is an easy way to evolve into seven point list or am I doomed with Zakar? Uh, okay, I don't think you're doomed with Zakar, uh, obviously. I think he's an amazing caster. Uh, let's talk about how to get to 75 points. Um, I don't have uh, my tools in front of me, but I'm going to talk about a few things that you, I think you can do. I actually had somebody ask me this question in an email. I think this is going to be a common question that people have. Uh, so you start at zero points and a lot of them are going to want to do this within the confines of a journeyman league. Um, and I think that's fine, but I, I'm not going to constrict myself to those situations. Um, but we'll, we'll stick with you know, you bought the battle box, you want to get to 75 points, so you've already got a, a Savage, a Brute, um, and a Gladiator, okay? So how do you get to 75 points? I think the first couple of things you probably need to do, let's, let's, let's say we're gonna make the jump to 10 points. Now, obviously, if you're in a Journeyman League, that would probably be an Agonizer. If you're not in a Journeyman League, and your first, what's your first purchase? Your first purchase is gonna be a unit of Pangiver Beast Handlers. Uh, where do you go from there? Um, so I think you probably go a couple of different directions. You probably need to add some support. Uh, obviously, you're going to flop whatever you didn't buy uh, to get to the ten points. Uh, well, it would only get you to seven, but you're going to, you know, you're going to pick up the agonizer or the pingiver beast handlers, whatever you didn't have uh, at first. Uh, then I think you probably need to start looking at another beast or potentially a unit. Uh, I think the, probably the first beast you're going to want to get is a sentry. Obviously, I just talked poorly about the sentry, but I, like I said, I think that it's too important to our faction identity to just ignore it. Uh, so sentry is probably the next purchase. Uh, from there, I, I think that you're going to have to make a choice whether you want to go with, uh, say, blood runners or you want to go with Karax. My personal choice is Karax. I actually think the Blood Runners are probably the better choice with Zakar, but I think you're gonna take Blood Runners in more lists across the board. So uh, if you're gonna stick with Zakar and you're gonna play him a while, I'd probably suggest the Blood Runners and maybe a, a Blood Runner Master Tormentor. Um, so, I mean, that's gonna get you to, say, close to 30 points. Um, you're probably going to add in a solo, uh, like a, bla uh, let's see, I already added the Blood Bloodrunner Master Tormentor. You're probably going to add in uh, uh, Marketh uh, at that point to get you to 35 points. Marketh is going to allow you to cast uh, Mortality uh, more frequently. Um, and if he gains a few souls, he's going to be able to boost those mortalities and guarantee they hit. So that you're going to have two mortalities a turn. Just going to make you uh, super strong. I mean, having two to three mortalities a turn is almost like having a feat every turn. So... Um, so at some point in there, probably in the 35 to 50 transition, um, if you haven't already got the sentry, you're going to want to get it. At some point, you're probably going to want to pick up a Cyclops Shaman. So you can either do a Shaman or you can do uh, the Bone Grinders. What you need is Craft Talisman. You need to be able to add two inches to your uh, mortality range. It allows... I, let me just state that I think that with Zakar uh, trying to whip anything and use his uh, special ability to auto hit with spells is, is this complete waste of time. Uh, you're just putting yourself in danger. You're better off standing 12 inches back with uh, Craft Talisman and boosting the to hit roll on the mortality. And if you miss, just saying, okay, whatever. My caster's going to live, uh, but I didn't get the mortality. Okay, so that's far more important. Uh, stay back. I mean, obviously, there's going to be some situations where you can apply it better, but you're going to need to. You're going to want a shaman or um, bone grinders. So, at that point, you, you've got a unit, you've got some support, um, you've got a couple of beasts. Uh, at the end, really, I, I'm probably going to want to to lean towards some range attacks. I, I like the reavers in that last 25 point span from 50 to 75. I think the reavers are probably a great choice, but I don't think you have to do those. I think incendiary are another great choice. Um, obviously. Uh, another great choice would, and probably a, a real solid one, uh, would be um, the brigands. So the the feral brigands at that point level are a great addition. Again, you probably uh, need to make a choice between adding that second unit or and maybe a heavy. Um, I think that a third heavy at this point, maybe a Tiberian, uh, and then a, say a solo like a, a Willbreaker, uh, is probably what your last 25 points might look like. But I think that you can 
figure out some other things as well. You might be able to fit both. You can say take a, a gladiator and a, you know, uh, depending on where you fit the other stuff, maybe this is the point where you add in your Carax. So, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not putting together the exact 75 point list, but I think that you can probably progress through in a manner in which you will end up with a quality 75 point list and you'll not really be buying anything extra. And it's a lot of stuff you're going to use in other locations. So Reverse Plus UA is a great, you know, uh, investment. They're going to come in and, and they're, they're valuable and with mortality, they're super deadly. Um, and they're going to be able to con contribute uh, in, in other lists as well. So uh, I think Zakar is a great caster to start with. I think that it teaches one of the best lessons that any new player in War Machine or Hordes can learn, and that's to keep your caster back. Um, hopefully people learn that. I think the mortality cast from 12 inches out is way better than moving in. And if you can learn that lesson, stand behind the wall, cast the mortality at range, and carry that lesson into the rest of War Machine, it will help you out throughout your career, learning to keep your caster safe. So, um, let's go on. I've only got time for one more question. Um, thoughts on Pimakeda as an answer to what will be fairly common Signar or Ret gun lines, Sloan or Ossian? Uh, I'll be honest, I have not played Pimakeda. I look at it and I don't particularly find it interesting. I think we can build enough shield guards in a list without using her. I just don't think she's a quality caster. I think that they gutted her too bad. I, I honestly, this is my honest feeling and this is a gut feeling. I, like I said, have not played her. So keep that in mind when I say this. I think she's our worst caster. Um, on paper, she certainly looks like it to me. Like I don't need her to be able to get my stuff across the board. I have, I have bugs. They, they don't need shield guards. I have shield guards all over the place to get the rest of the stuff across the board. Uh, I have surprisingly, you know, survivable casters that can just stay back or can hide behind all that stuff. So I think that, uh, Pima Keda is probably, uh, she's going to be our Naresh of this edition, the, you know, where people are just kind of trying to figure her out. She's basically the Zerkova of Mark II. You know, I won with Makeda 1, and the people are just going to try it over and over and over again, and we're going to see it all over the place. For the next three years, you're going to see people trying to make Makeda 1 work. Her feet got worse, uh, folks. I mean, her spells got strictly worse. Uh, she's just not... She doesn't bring anything to the table that you can't build somewhere else in Scorn. I, I, I think that you might be able to put together a list, but in the end, in a tournament setting, why don't you just pick one of the other casters that does it better and build a list that can deal with shooting? So, uh, you know, I don't think Scorn is in any danger any more than anybody else of being shot off the table. I mean, obviously we're going to have some issues. Uh, we're going to get shot. We're going to get beat up on our approach. And I think that is a problem in the game, but I don't think Makeda fixes it any better than any of the other casters do. So, um, you know, find your... Uh, answer to those gun lines. Uh, if you feel like it's Pima Keda, that's fine. It's not my answer. I won't be taking Pima Keda anytime soon. I think a gun line can be built. I can think a gun line can be countered uh, with a lot of other casters in the faction. So, uh, I mean, take a uh, something where you can get their armor values high enough that they just, you know, don't matter. Um, something like a Xerxes. I mean, we can, we can make it across the board without having to resort to using Pima Keda. So, anyway, um, I, I think next week we're probably going to talk about Naresh. I played a couple of games with him this week. Uh, I'm excited to talk about him. Uh, we'll probably talk about a few other things. I think I might slow down a little bit on the number of models I'm covering and maybe talk a little bit about a few other things like list pairing. I don't know. If, you, if you're interested in other topics besides just reviews on the models, let me know. And we'll this maybe this format can evolve. We can do something different. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone who supports this stream uh, via Patreon and encourage anybody who tuned in late to go check out my Patreon page and support it. Uh, the money that I earn from Patreon goes to support my WTC team, uh, and I know they will be uh, very grateful. I'm certainly grateful for any support you provide uh, to this stream and to the things that I do for the community. So I uh, thank you guys once again. I hope you enjoyed this episode of A Man Scorned, and we'll see you again in a couple weeks.